Hey humans, how's it going? Susan Ruth here. Thanks for listening to another episode of Hey Human Podcast. This is episode 357, and I had a conversation with Dean Collins. Dean is a retired Navy pilot and current Delta commercial air pilot. He's also a performing songwriter. His new song, Land Where the Wishes Come True, is out now. We discuss his dad's influence on his love of music, flight school, and unusual things he's seen in the sky. It was a really fun conversation, and I've known Dean for a little while now, and I hope you enjoy. Check out heyhumanpodcast.com for links, Hey Human merch, and to learn more about my guests and the show. Check out susanruth.com to learn more about me and my other artistic endeavors. You can follow me, Susan Ruthism, and Hey Human Podcast on social media. Find my albums on Apple Music or wherever you get your music. And check out my relationships and sex show that I do with my friend Mara Edelman. It's called Are We There Yet? on YouTube. She is a sexologist and healthcare practitioner. We have a lot of fun on the show. It's called Are We There Yet? Podcast Show. Pretty easy to find there on YouTube. Rate, review, and subscribe to Hey Human on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. All right. Thanks for listening. Be well. Be kind, be love, and here we go. Dean Collins, welcome to Hey Human. Well, thank you very much, Susan. It's great to be here. And we met, gosh, uh, I would say right before the pandemic, really, right? Yeah, it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we met at that fun party for Maureen, her goodbye yeah. party. Sing, sing uh, goodbye, you know, to our LA friend who was moving out. And, and that's how we met. And it was just uh, serendipitous. Yeah, that's a fun little party. It was. Yeah. It was very fun. And I met some really interesting and amazing people there. But that's no surprise knowing Maureen. Yes, yeah, for sure. And uh, also quite accomplished friends in the room, <laughs> in, the yeah. musical, in the musical world and in film and television as well. But it, I was geeking out a little bit over Tom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was too. I, I have a photo with him. And when I talked to him that day, it was funny. Um, he was wearing a photo of, uh, I mean, a t-shirt of the, uh, the clash. And I said, Oh man, I saw them back. I think it was 1982 at the Aragon ballroom in Chicago when I was at school up there. He said I was there. So that was kind of funny that, you know, we were both there watching the clash um, in Chicago all those years ago. Well, let's get into you and your life. Where are you from? Where did you grow up? So I'm from Kentucky. I was born in St. Louis, but my dad worked for Ralston Purina. So he worked in the feed division and moved around a lot. So Indiana, Kentucky, you know, rural. So that is kind of where I started having memories. I probably moved, I think I was about three when we moved to Bardstown, Kentucky, a uh, very small town at the time. It might've had 7,000 people. And uh, it is also the heart of the bourbon trail and the bourbon capital of the world. And uh, it's a little bigger now. So that's kind of, as I started remembering things, I was on a farm in Bardstown, Kentucky. So that's kind of where I started. Did you have a lot of animals? Oh, yeah. We had um, probably 800 head of cattle and we had, you know, pigs and geese and chickens and gardens, you know, all that stuff. And it was, it was interesting because growing up, I never felt poor. Um, because we had an abundance of food and we had all, you know, 650 acres. I mean, my backyard was pretty big. It wasn't until, uh, you know, I was at school and I think a teacher said, hey, is that your only pair of jeans? I said, no, I have three. <laughs> so, you know, one for Monday, one for, you know, Wednesday and one for Friday. And that kind of made me scratch my head a little bit as a kid. Like, well, that's kind of weird. But um, I guess later in life, you know, I, maybe she thought I didn't have very much. But I felt really like we had an abundance of everything. Well, I would argue that you did. And that she, did. that she probably, here's the thing, material things aren't the thing, right? So, right. yeah, I mean, yeah. but from the yeah. outside, I think a lot of people, there's an emptiness that can be filled with stuff, but the, mm -hmm. the trick of it is, is that will never fill, right? And so exactly. when you see somebody that doesn't seem to have a lot, but they're very happy mm -hmm. and fulfilled and full of life, it's probably very confusing to a person who has a ton of stuff and doesn't have that feeling inside. Yeah, I agree. And um, 
you know, I think I had it all figured out, you know, and then it made me kind of question that, but, you know, I'm like, eh, I'm, I'm doing good. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm happy with this. I never felt like I was lacking. Also inappropriate of a teacher to say that unless they were worried about your safety. That's another thing. But. I know, I know, but this is, you know, years ago and, sure. uh, you know, I'll, I'll give her the benefit of the doubt. Maybe your intentions were good. Did you have a favorite animal on the farm? You know, when, what I really loved, I loved the little pigs. Sometimes they would be um, like the runts, you know, cause there was a teat for every, every little piglet. And sometimes there might be one too many, so or it might be small, and it might not. And so we'd have to like save it because it wasn't getting enough food, and it was smaller than the rest. So every once in a while, my mom or my stepdad would come home with a pig, a little one, and we would have to bottle feed it and raise it. And so we would have a pig running around, Aww. and so I'd have my friends over, and we'd play, you know, like catch the pig. You know, we didn't grease it, but that pig was hard to catch. They're fast when they're little. So I've got a lot of good memories of that. And it was always so sad. It was like, I don't know, it was pig puberty or what, but at a certain point, the pig like would go back with the other pigs. And I would, I'd had these visions like, you know, Charlotte's web. Like I, I go up to the fence and the little pig is running to see me. And it was like, I, he never came by again. I go to that little fence and look for little Wilbur or wheelbarrow. I think we called him. And um, I love the idea of pink puberty. Like he's got acne. He just wants to play video games. I hate you, mom. <laughs> right, right. He just, I, he guess he hated his parents at that point. So um, anyway, so that was, uh, but I loved raising them. And then we raised baby calves too, but the calves never, you know, they just wanted food. They never really became pets or warmed up to us. Probably the pig. The pig was my favorite. The little pigs that we would hand raise. They are quite bright. They are. They're smart smart pigs. I remember feeding them Dr. Pepper once and a, a bigger pig and it, it came up and we had um, a bottle for it and it loved Dr. Pepper. Went nuts about that. So yeah, we had a lot of pigs running around and, um, and cattle. Did you stay on that farm until you left for college? I did. Yeah. So it's a little complicated because my, my parents, when they were married, moved to Bardstown and we lived in town and then they found a place. There's just one little property in the middle of the 650 acres that one of the family members built a house there and sold it. And so we bought that and lived there. And then years later, after my parents divorced, we came back to Kentucky and uh, my mom um, ended up marrying the owner of the farm. So there we were back again. Another Shakespearean. I know it was. And, you know, one. so we ended up there. So I was on the farm uh, very young and we moved to Indiana a few times. And then when they divorced in Indiana, we came back to Kentucky and then they had a romance and got married and we were back on the farm. I guess we were on the one acre and then we moved to the 649 acres after that. Wow. So, Did you get along with your stepdad? Oh yeah. Yeah. He was older than my mom and he was from a different era. He was from the early um, 1900s, but he was very quiet very soft-spoken, and uh, he didn't say a lot, but when he did, it was important, and he was very welcoming. I mean, he had two, you know, my brother and I were, you know, nine and uh, five when, you know, we suddenly pop into his life, and he was very patient and understanding and loving and built me a tree house, you know, taught me to drive tractors at a, you know, young age, and and we would help him sometimes on the farm, and that was always a real thrill, and um, so yeah, he was a, he was a great stepdad and I, I've learned a lot. I use a lot of the skills from him now that I'm a stepdad. So yeah, I learned a lot from him. He passed away a few years ago, but, um, what's his know, name? Henry, Henry Hart. Here's to Henry. Yeah. Here's to Henry. So yeah, that farm had been in the family since 1830 and it became a farm in 1792 when Kentucky became a state. So it's a, you know. From from American point of view, it's pretty old. Is it still in your family? Yeah, yeah, my mom's still there. She's still there in a, a the log cabin he built her, uh, right next to a log cabin, probably from 1792 when the farm, you know, when the first owner was there. So she is still there. And, and the farm is still an active farm. It is. Well, we had cattle. We just sold our cattle, or we have a few left. But um, it's really hard to maintain cattle because then you have to keep the 
fences. There's a big impact on the environment. And, and frankly, it's, it's a, more of a young man's game. And, you know, it just wasn't feasible. So we're, we're talking about converting it to corn because there's so many distilleries there. And, you know, bourbon is 51% corn minimum. We're talking about doing that and just having cornfields. Um, that's one of the things we're kicking around because the the cows are just too much. You know, the corn doesn't sneak into neighbors' yards or fields at two in the morning when you have to go get it. So. I don't know. I've seen children of the corn. <laughs> <laughs> There's some weird <laughs> things that happen in the corn. Well, that is true. That is kind of cool. <laughs> when you were a kid, did you have aspirations to be a pilot? Did you think I just want to get out of this? It sounds like you had a nice upbringing, so not necessarily like, get out of this one cow town. But did you have aspirations to be a pilot from a young age? You know, I did. Um, my grandfather, um, he used to work for Curtis Wright in the early 1900s. And he was one of the first 17 um, employees hired by uh, James McDonald, which became McDonald Douglas. So before he retired, he worked on the F-4 Phantom. So all that, what that means is when I was a little kid born in St. Louis, they lived in Ferguson, the time spent with my grandparents, I was surrounded by airplanes and, oh, there's the Blue Angels, um, you know, signed thing on the wall. Oh, there's the Thunderbirds there and models everywhere. So I thought that was normal. So I thought, oh man, this is the greatest thing because kids, you know, little boys love trains and, and airplanes and, you know, whatever kind of heavy machinery. and. Um, so I remember being at a park there with my grandparents and, and I want to say I was like three, but I do remember looking in the sky and seeing a contrail and asking, what is that? And I could see like the little glint of, you know, the plane or whatever. And they told me it was an airplane. And I said, wow, I, I want to be up there someday or something, you know, to that effect. They told me later. And um, I guess I never got rid of that. So you're right. I didn't want to escape the farm. But I had, I did started developing dreams that were probably bigger than the farm, in a sense. And I started thinking about flying and how to make that a reality, you know, coming from a small town without much, you know, financial support. So I did start thinking about that pretty early. So I guess I kind of knew. Was there any pressure to stick around and be a part of the farm life? There was... They were actually really good about it. Um, more of like, you're always welcome. You don't have to, you know, like you can go wherever you want, but you are welcome here kind of a thing. But it wasn't like a hard sell, like the farm's going to go bankrupt without you or whatever. Um, so there wasn't that kind of a, a pressure. I, I did know that I, I wanted to go out of state. I wanted to, you know, like see the world a little bit. Come, you know, coming from, a, from that background, I, I started looking had a way to pay for college and a good college. And I looked at the United States Navy uh, Reserve, you know, officer. Board, so ROTC. Um, and so I started looking at that too, as a means to get to a great college and then have a job when I got out. So all that kind of started, you know, started wanting to fly, study hard in school, and then kind of figure out how to make the college thing work. But somewhere in there, there was a there was a, a pull towards music, and my parents were wonderful. Um, you know, I still remember being with my dad and listening to Johnny Cash, and his, and looking at his record collection. I mean, as a little kid, you know, a few years old, looking at the Jimi Hendrix album cover with the snakes and everything on it, that was amazing. And he had all the Beatles albums, and I remember being a little kid popping the Beatles on the record player and and listening. So, and my mom loved John Denver. She loved, you know, Carol King, like a, a lot of, you know, classic artists. And so I always had music in my life and I would sing at the top of my lungs, you know, along with them. And I, I do remember, I think when I, when I hit uh, people puberty, not pig puberty, but when I hit puberty and my voice started changing, I was devastated because I could no longer sing Really Rosie with Carol King uh, at the top of my lungs without going to fall. So, but music was always uh, there as well. That was another pull I had, but maybe not towards a career, but just a love or a passion for it. So you ended up joining Art Rodsey, I assume. I did. I, yeah, I, I applied and got a scholarship 
And um, at the time, it was wherever you could get into, you could go. And so I'd applied to Vanderbilt and Notre Dame and um, some other places. And I decided since my, you know, after the divorce, my dad ended up in Chicago. And I thought, well, I love Chicago. You know, the times I'd visited him, that was, you know, a huge city to me. You know, that was amazing. One of the best cities. I love Chicago. Oh, I know. The first time I looked up, my dad drove us there in a convertible Mustang, 1965 Mustang. I was in the back seat. And the top was down. And I remember going right by the Sears Tower. My dad had told me about it. I'm looking up and the top's in a cloud. I mean, it's nighttime, but I can see it just disappears into the clouds. And I thought that was the most amazing thing. So um, I started working there in the summers. And so when college came up, I had learned about Northwestern's acting program and and, uh, was very interested in the college. So that's what, what brought me there. And acting and music, what, you were allowed to do that kind of thing if you were going through Navy? I would think they well, were engineering or some sort of a right. science. So I, I kind of pulled a fast one. Um, uh-huh. I was accepted as a computer science major. And when I interviewed, I interviewed with um, Kathy Wood, who was at the time the, uh, the dean of the school of speech. And she was interviewing me and she said, you know, you should really be in the school of communication in my, in my school doing radio, TV, film and theater. And uh, I said, well, I can't really do theater because the Navy won't accept that. And she's like, Oh, well, you can minor in it. I said, okay, well, I'm trying to get the scholarship. Okay. Get the scholarship, do the transfer. I'll see you in a year or something like that. So it was, uh, so I did go there initially as computer science um, and then did my transfer. And because radio, TV, film was a bachelor of science in speech, that worked because it had the word science in it. And, but then I did have to do half my electives in, you know, science and math and I had requirements. So I would go into calculus and calculus based physics with my film camera and my ballet shoes, um, which was kind of odd, but (laughs) it all worked out. So you're right. It it wasn't, it didn't make me as uh, competitive had I done that. Um, but after I got to college and switched majors, it, it was great. You are a well-rounded individual. <laughs> well, I have a, a lot of things I like, and I, I think they're in both sides of the brain, if that old adage is still true. Yeah, I interviewed Dr. Amara Edelman, who taught at Northwestern. Oh. Yeah. Oh, that's great. And at the time that you were there, from my understanding. Oh, my gosh, that's so cool. I just yeah. went back to my 35th reunion. Um, but I did love, I love the experience there. I love living in Chicago. I love the friends I made there and um, talk about diverse. They were just so, you know, uh, so interesting. And I met people from all different levels of affluence or whatever. And, uh, and I came from, from not a lot, but it was funny. My mom told me before I went, she said, you know, if you, if you are kind, you can, you know, sit at any table. And she was right. Yeah, that's good advice. When you first were in the Navy, were you assigned faraway place right away? What What did you end up doing while you were there? So it's kind of interesting how, uh, you know, when you first are, are, I'm sorry, when you're graduating, uh, you know, getting ready to go into the Navy, you're commissioned as an ensign. And they say, what do you want to do in the Navy? Because there's different things. You, you can even go to the Marine Corps, which, you know, is, is kind of with the Navy, but not, you know, there were, we're frenemies. Um, but um, so at the time I wanted to fly, obviously, because that's all I wanted to do. And uh, that pesky movie Top Gun had come out just before I, you know, was to select. And because Northwestern graduated so late, um, all the billets were taken for a year because everyone wanted to fly Tomcats in 1987. So I was delayed nearly a year. So that, so that first, you know, 11 months, they had me teaching sailing at Northwestern, uh, you know, on Lake Michigan, they had me driving a bus to pick up midshipmen or take them to and from O'Hare, which is probably scarier than landing on aircraft carriers, I have to say, was driving a bus through Chicago traffic and trying to navigate O'Hare as a, uh, you know, 22-year-old. Kind of did that waiting for flight school. And then, you know, when the opening came up the next year, 
I, you know, went to Pensacola, Florida, which is the cradle of naval aviation, and began my flying career there. I went in cold, and um, and I haven't haven't stopped. I still fly to this day. I gotta ask when you first. Obviously, you go through a lot of simulation before they put you mm-hmm. in an actual plane. Mm-hmm. What was that transition like to go from simulation gadget to, oh my God, I'm flying a multi million dollar aircraft? <laughs> well, it was, um, you know, it's little building blocks. So it's not like they say, here's a whole elephant, eat it. You know, okay, here's his toe. You know, like they, they kind of do it so that it's, you know, they can build your way up. But I will say that, you know, you have the simulators to begin with, and then you're in the whole, the, the plane. So you feel fairly confident in the simulators doing the checklist and everything. And then you get to the plane and it's like, holy cow, there's noise. It's hot. It's cold. I'm sweating, you know, all these real things. And oh my gosh, I'm feeling G's here. You know, I, I, feel, I weighed you know, two, three times my weight. And, uh, you know, so that was a big change. And then we did practice landings on you know on the airfield for the aircraft carrier and they had a little area at the end that was kind of painted and you land on that follow the meatball you know what they call the optical landing system and you would do practice after practice and okay cool but then I remember the first time I went from that where I felt okay to a real aircraft carrier and when you're coming behind the real thing and you're looking at this huge ship that looks very small and you're like, oh my God, I it's me and I'm by myself in this jet and I have to put it there. And if I mess up, that's really not good. So um, it was, I just remember being, uh, it was, I was gobsmacked that first time behind the aircraft carrier. And, um, and so the first time you have your hook up. So, you know, I, I don't think it, it wasn't my best performance because I think I was just so you know, and, and, and shock. Um, and, uh, so I did my touch and go, and then I was like, cool. So, Hey, I've seen it now. I'm good. And then it was fine. But that first moment was, was something to think that I'm controlling this, you know, piece of metal and I have to do a controlled crash, catch the wire and, you know, put all that training into practice. So the hookup is on the aircraft and you have to be snagged so that you don't go flying off into the water or into the side of the aircraft carrier. Right. So that if you have the hook up, that means it's, it's still, it doesn't, it can't catch the wire. So you can do a touch and go and that's fine. But once you lower the hook, you're, you're trying to catch one of the four wires and, and come to a stop. And the other thing about that, that was, you know, interesting is, they teach you to go full power when you land because if the wire breaks, which sometimes happens, or if you've missed it and you think you caught it, you could dribble off the edge. So I'm sitting there with the full power and I'm in the wire and the plane is being held there. And a, you know, a 20 something year old guy walks in front of me and goes like this, like pull the power back. You're good. We got you. And only then after someone walks in front of you, can you pull the power back? So so many things there that go against, you know, what you, your brain is telling you to do. So that guy's got a or woman has a gutsy job. Exactly. So um, they said, if they're walking in front of you, you're safe to pull the power. So anyway, also that's very surreal to think that a wire is stopping a jet. Yeah, it is. It's a, you know, it's a, you know, a couple inches thick, but, but that's it. And <laughs> that doesn't make me feel any better. <laughs> yeah i know it it doesn't doesn't and then um and then the catapult too that was that was a shocker um you know that much acceleration you know i mean it's like okay i guess tesla plaid or whatever but but this thing was like you know a couple seconds zero to 150 i mean it was crazy that's the thing that shoots you off the carrier yeah shoots you off the carrier yes and and I remember one time later when I was on a bigger airplane in the middle of the, uh, I think I was in the Red Sea. So it was a super hot day. It's over hundred degrees and we were really heavy. And I remember the um, uh, air boss on the ship, he's in charge of all the flight operations, comes on and says, okay, this is going to be, a, this is going to be a good one, Rawhide, or I'm sorry, we were uh, Bradshaw, we were um, a cargo outfit, but it was a, a big plane for the carrier. And when I launched my helmet, 
went off my head. And I remember it was hanging, <laughs> the strap was around my neck. And uh, I said, that was quite the catch. I don't know how many G's it was, but it was, it was something. I still remember that one. Also, the G-force against the strap against your neck, that could not have been comfortable. No, that was, <laughs> that was a little uncomfortable. I just kind of had to push my head back towards the, the headrest to keep it from, you know, going further. But um, Are you able to describe what it feels like going through G-forces? The G-force, there were times where we would do like a, a tight circle. And uh, I had jet training leading up to this because they want to train everyone kind of you know, with the possibility of landing on aircraft carriers. So even though I ended up flying a cargo plane, the training was in a jet. And I remember doing these really tight turns, pulling a lot of Gs, I think, I don't know, three or four Gs. But, you're, you know, just imagine everything in your body weighs four times as much. And I remember it was just, you have to make a grunting noise, almost like you're going to the restroom, like, Arr! and like you do that to keep the blood from pooling in your extremities. So we also had G-suits, which would inflate. They had something in the plane that when it felt G's, it would turn on a, like a little air compressor and fill it up to tighten uh, around your waist and legs so your blood wouldn't all leave your head and pool in your lower extremities, you know, and doing loops and so forth. So all of that was, uh, you know, I was really young. I was in my, you know, early 20s at the time, and I thought it was the coolest thing ever. And, uh, and nowadays it's like, I don't, I don't miss doing any of that, but I'm glad I did it. Oh my God. I bet you got laid all the time. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was funny. Um, <laughs> I can't even tell some of the stories, but, um, but it certainly gave me a lot of confidence, you know, and, and we all felt invincible. I mean, yeah, when you're young, you do anyway, but here I was facing basically death in my job. And, and, you know, walking away every time saying, yeah, got you again. And so that typical, you know, invincible feeling of your teens and, and 20s um, probably was magnified, you know, by, by, by my occupation. How does your brain and your eyeballs move? How do they move that quickly when you're taking in all that information going so quickly? Well, the, the nice thing about about that particular the the act of landing on aircraft carrier is they distill it down to the very simple things and they call it meatball lineup angle of attack and so you follow those three things and and you can just tune out everything else so the meatball is the optical landing system you have a a yellow it looks like a yellow dot and then there's a couple there's lights that go across and you're trying to put the dot in the middle that means you are on the you know, three degree glide slope uh, that is behind the aircraft carrier. Um, so that's the meatball portion, whether you're high or low. Lineup is the center line. You're, you want to be right on that. Uh, my plane was very wide and I had probably 10 feet of side of clearance or else I'm whacking other airplanes. So that's not a lot. So you had to get the lineup just right. And then angle of attack, the aircraft, they wanted at a constant um, angle because that puts the hook in a position to catch the wire. If your nose is down, you're too fast, the hook is up and it won't catch the wire. And if it's too high, you're too slow and uh, that's bad in other ways. So you could really distill it down to those three things and kind of tune everything out and just kind of get in that zone, focus on these those three things. And now, you know, there were times when there were multiple ships lined up beside the aircraft carriers I'm landing like for fueling and, and all the, uh, you know, all these support ships or helicopters were hanging out right there, or there's another plane flying over here and there's all these planes in the overhead. And I had to tune all that out and just land. So they, they did distill it down to those three things, which was really help, helpful to focus on just that. What was your call sign? Well, you know, some guys, you know, the movies make you think, oh, wow, you must have had a cool call sign or whatever. Well, they didn't give you call signs based on accolades and things you did well. So, you know, some guy might be called Chunks because he threw up on his first flight and it sticks with him forever. I was Dino. So for whatever reason, it was like Dino the dinosaur close enough. You know, it's like not a lot of thought, D-I-N-O or whatever it was. So I just became Dino. And I, I consider myself fortunate because <laughs> some of those guys... Uh, they, they won't even tell their own kids what their call signs were because they were so awful and embarrassing to them. So, 
how long after training until you went into a war situation or a battle situation? It was unusual because I had just finished. So once you finish the jet training and get your wings, your wings of gold, they put us in, we decided what we, or the Navy decided what we were going to fly in the fleet. So I was assigned the C2, which is the Greyhound or the COD for carry on board delivery. So we carried passengers, we carried cargo, and we carried, you know, ended up carrying special forces and a lot of cool things. But we had to do training for that. Mine was in Norfolk, Virginia. So I finished uh, late fall of 1990 and Desert Shield was already going on. So when I got to the squadron in, in November, they got me up to call and said, you're going to be flying in support of this, you know, it was Iraqi War One, I guess. So it did, I was there a couple months and then January, I was landing in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, the night that the, you know, war kicked off. So I remember I'd been flying, you know, through Egypt. I went through Cairo West and there was a, a military um, squadron there of tankers. And I remember ask, uh, asking one of the guys, hey, what's going on? He said, I don't know, but um, you should probably land by midnight. I said, land by midnight? We're going to Jeddah. And he's like, yeah, land by midnight. I said, why do you say that? I said, well, I can't say, but see all these planes here? They're not going to be here at midnight. And they were all tankers. And I'm like, ooh. So as soon as I land, I go inside and then the green CNN, you know, the air war begins had started. So I just walked right into that. And then they're handing me these pins to stick myself with in case I get gassed and they're handing gas masks. So it was like, welcome to the squadron, you know, here's your first war and your first combat mission is tomorrow. Something like that. So that's. That and you were 23. Three ish then? 23, 24. Yeah, I was probably because I had a year a year waiting for flight school, probably 24. It took two years. Do they prep you for, do they prep you mentally, I should say, for that kind of experience? Or do they just throw you to the wolves and then you have to figure out how to handle it? Well, there's always, so I, you start out as a co pilot and there's a more senior guy who's the aircraft commander, but they always say, you know, stick with your training. That's why they teach those three things at the aircraft carrier, meatball lineup, angle, and attack, just to keep it simple so you don't get overwhelmed with all these other things. And then as you gain more experience, now you're sitting in the left seat, you're the commander, and you you take in now your your field of view has increased, your tunnel vision has increased. I mean on the level of I'm now in a war. My oh. life is in jeopardy here mm -hmm. not the uh, can i fly a plane but just the everyday existential crisis of being in that experience i guess i i didn't really think of it so we had it a little different because we were not on the aircraft carrier we were in Jeddah, saudi arabia and they put us up on a compound so we would drive to the airport go out fly to the aircraft carriers fly around in country um, a lot of our mission was taking um, CNN reporters, news reporters to the front lines or close close to the front lines. And I remember I had Christiana Mapur on one of the flights and we went into, um, uh, I think it was Riyadh. And I remember all these journalists getting out of the plane and then I see them running and they were running to a bunker and uh, the tower said, well, there's an inbound scud, it's doing whatever, um, say intentions. And we're like, Oh, uh, we're going to get out of here. So I remember lifting off and there's like all these, you know, sirens and stuff at the airport. But um, I just think part of that was just uh, youth. It just, it didn't really bother me that much. It just, it's like, well, I, I guess I trained for this, you know? So, and the other guys around me were calm. And so it's like, okay, got this. How long did you serve? So I did 10, just over 10 years active duty, and then I did 10 years in the reserves. I did the full 20, half of it was part-time, half full-time. Mm -hmm. And so I retired in 2007. And the odd thing is I consider myself, oh, I'm a, you know, I'm this Navy trained pilot, which I am. But now I realize I've been at Delta Airlines for 25 plus years. So I've actually been at Delta longer than I was in the Navy, which is, you know, was kind of mind blowing when I thought about it. When you left the Navy, which I know you're always in the Navy, but when you were discharged and got out, what was your rank? 
So when I find, when I got out, um, uh, I think at the first part I was a lieutenant. Maybe I just made lieutenant commander, or, and then I was lieutenant commander. I think I was lieutenant when I got out after ten years because I was just coming up on 04 lieutenant commander, and then I made lieutenant commander, and I retired as lieutenant commander. And does that transfer into commercial airline flying? Do you keep the same title? No, all that goes out the window. It's okay. just, um, it's all about hours and interviews and experience and resumes at that, you know, at that point. Well, they must like bringing in pilots who have military experience. Oh, yeah. In fact, in the old days, um, it's so funny to think of myself as, you know, joining the airlines in the old days. But um, I want to say that in the, uh, you know, bef- previously at the airlines, they had like a 60, 70 percent military. I mean, it was a very high number. And now it's much less. It's much more civilian trained in the militaries. And, uh, you know, there's there's less pilots available. They're trying to keep them staying longer in the uh, military. So there's just not the supply. So it's probably I don't, I'm guessing like 30 percent now. So it's fallen quite a bit. But it certainly was a help back then. That's correct. That was very helpful. It was great training. Were you flying on September 11th? I was, but I was flying with the military. So that was kind of um, surreal because I was at my old squadron. My first squadron, I think you had alluded to this, it was overseas. It was in Italy, in in Sicily. Sigonella uh, base there in Sicily was my first uh, squadron. So years later, on September 11th, I'm back there, but flying a different air, a different cargo airplane, like a DC-9, but a militarized one. And I'm with some of the same people I served with in that squadron. And I had just flown a mission, and I landed, and it was still early in the morning. And I remember someone ran to the plane, ran out to the plane, and said, "The World Trade Center uh, uh, commuter just hit it." And I said. I think it was those guys who tried to do it before, you know, like terrorists. And they said, no, no, they're saying on the news it was a commuter. And so, of course, we run inside and uh, watched everything unfold in real time. So I had been flying that day, but not, but not in um, the, uh, not in at Delta. So, as we were talking over there at the end of the day, we were trying to keep track of all our airline friends because there were guys from different squadrons. I mean, different, I'm sorry, from different uh, airlines. And, um, and we couldn't find uh, our old commanding officer who was not, did not fly in the airlines, but he had just retired and was working at the Pentagon. This was Captain Jack Punches. And so no one could find, you know, where's where's you know captain where's captain punches and it turned out he was sitting at his desk when the uh, american airlines flew into the pentagon he had gotten a a ground job there and um so that really was you know just hit hit hard especially for the people who served under him because he was our first commanding officer and he was a wonderful uh humorous just a gregarious man and to think he had been through combat and all these you know, all this stuff. And then to be sitting at his desk was just, it was tragic. And I remember going to a U2 concert later and they scrolled all the names. And I remember seeing his name up there and just hit pretty good. So so we we were over there when that happened. um, And, uh, and incidentally, one of the first flights the Navy had in Europe, I think I was on that one as well. When it was several days later, they shut down the, you know, almost worldwide, they shut down flying. So they let us fly because we had to pick up a SEAL team that was somewhere in Turkey. And they wanted to get them home because they didn't know if they would need to send a SEAL team. They didn't know how big this was or where it came from at the time. So we flew one of the first missions in Europe after September 11th. And I remember these guys, you know, coming out of the, you know, you know, they, they come to the plane and we park somewhere, not, not like at a terminal, but somewhere, you know, ramp area. And these guys are like coming out of the bushes and stuff with all these, with all their gear. I remember sitting in the back of the plane and I had flown in and one of the other pilots was going to fly out of there. So I'm sitting in the back with these SEALs talking to them. And as we're taking off, I remember, I think there were like 50 caliber rounds rolling like they had, they had like weapons with them and they just gathered it all up and, and 
came out. And I remember things were hitting my feet and I looked down there, 50 caliber rounds, like rolling through the plane. <laughs> and I'm like, well, I sure hope we don't uh, crash or have a fire because this thing is going up like a Roman candle. But um, anyway, that was just one of the memories. So that was one of the first flights and uh, it was just really surreal. I have a few friends that are in the special forces of various kind, different branches and some of the stories that they tell highly redacted of course oh um, yeah bonkers and okay. you you describing them as coming out of the bushes is so accurate yeah i know or up out of the water i mean it's like a movie i know it really is yeah they're the the stories they don't tell are often more interesting even more even more terrifying and interesting than the ones they can tell of course so of course it is weird to think that all over the world there's you know, the little mound of dirt might actually be a person peeking out from underneath it, you know? Exactly. So wild. How did you decide on, on which airlines? It was it a, did you go through different airlines and then decide that Delta was the one that you really liked or was it because it had an international thing? You know, it's, it's kind of funny, kind of like I knew I wanted to fly. I remember I had, I think I had just graduated and maybe I was at the homecoming that year because I was there in Chicago for that bonus year. And I remember I was with a, a, a friend and her mom showed up at the homecoming and it was almost like an interview out of the blue. I wasn't, I wasn't dating her daughter. I was just standing with, I was just with her. She said, well, Dean, where do you see yourself in 10 years? What are your 10 year goals? And, you know, I just graduated and I was going into the Navy. I mean, I was already in the Navy, but I wasn't flying yet. And I said, well, in 10 years, I, I'm going to be flying for Delta Airlines. So that was kind of, you know, you know, she turned the spotlight on and I just kind of blurted out. And I, I think, you know, I'd flown a bunch of different airlines when I was younger, but I remember going through Atlanta and they had this neon sign that said, fly Delta Jets. And when I was younger, I thought, how cool is that? I'd love to do that. Little did I know that was an advertisement before as jets were just becoming popular. They had, they had prop planes. And so Delta was bragging that they actually had jets. I thought they were recruiting pilots. And I thought, how cool is that when I was younger? So that was, you know, part of the part of my, uh, you know, fascination with Delta was based on a misunderstanding of their, their neon sign at their headquarters in Atlanta, which you can see as you taxi past. And uh, I kind of chuckle about that every time I go to Atlanta and see that fly Delta jets is not a pilot recruiting tool, but, but it worked with me. So hilarious. All right. You know that I'm going to ask you this because I told you I was going to ask you this. Okay. What are some of the weird things you've seen as a pilot? So that isn't redacted on you either. No, no, it's, it's, it's not redacted. I mean, some of the weird things I've seen are things that, are are probably rarely seen, but um, but they're you know it's landing on the aircraft carrier. This the strangest thing I've ever seen is the aircraft carrier, which is huge. Um, when the weather's really bad, they cancel flight operations. Like if the planes are going to break or you know can't land on the middle of the ocean, they cancel flight operations. And one particular day in the North Atlantic, they we would bring out high priority cargo mail parts and stuff and they needed whatever we had but we were operating out of norway and i remember getting out to the ship and this the winds were like 50 knots and the sea state was so bad that when i rolled in behind the carrier to land the entire back of the ship came up in the air including the screws like the big propellers on this aircraft carrier which are ginormous you know are just churning and spitting out foam and i'm like i I, am you know back then there were no cell phones there were no cameras you know i didn't i was just trying to you know keep my composure and land this thing and uh, i'm like i wonder how many people have seen this you know and so uh, that's not an unexplained thing but that is something that I don't think a lot of people have seen because if if the sea state is that bad, they're not landing air, airplanes typically. Another strange thing was when I was, uh, you know, also in the Navy in Europe, I remember flying and I'm, we're probably at 28,000 feet or so. And I see something green, like a green, almost looks like a rocket or, you know, I just see this green glow of something shoot up um, in front of the airplane. 
And we're a little bit in the cloud, so I don't have a good view, but something just shot up in front of me. And I i don't know what it was. And I reported the traffic controller. Was there a missile shoot? You know, I never figured out what that was. But the visibility was so low, I really couldn't see it. And I think the other strange thing I saw, you know, you always hear the old stories about St. Elmo's fire and the weird things and some of the old planes and stuff. I was in the 727, which, you know, is retired now. But we, we got near storms, not in them, but close enough where the St. Elmo's fire. So the, you started getting in the glow on the windscreen and on, on your windshield and little lightning and everything. And so I've seen it a lot since then. But this particular time, there were two pitot tubes, which are, you know, for pressure, for figuring out your airspeed and stuff. And they stick out like almost little antlers, and, but they're real, they're pretty short, but they stick out in the front. And I remember they started glowing orange and then they got brighter and brighter. And then the lightning bolts, these purple lightning bolts started shooting out from this, these pitot tubes. And it was out 20 or 30 feet into the clouds, like, you know, these moving lightning bolt things. So Another another thing that it wasn't it wasn't like a mystery. I knew what it was, but I had never seen and I've never seen anything like that. It was like these <laughs> lightning antlers in front of the plane just floating through the clouds. So I saw I saw the uh, you know right after Elon Musk launched the um, the satellites. You know I was over I was going to Alaska and it was a dark night and I'm over the water and I what it looks like a formation of drones in a line in the sky but they're almost as bright as stars when you see them so i had never seen that before that's the most amazing thing i've seen man-made object i've seen i've seen the space station i saw the space station rendezvous with the um with the space shuttle back over the atlantic years ago i could see the two little dots closing it wasn't very exciting but that's what they were because the guys on the radio were updating us on it but um but when i saw that formation of his um you know, all those little satellites in a row. I remember thinking, is that is that drones? No, they're too high. They're in space. Is that a formation of UFOs? But many of with- your colleagues, of course, have seen some inexplicable things. And I don't know if you've ever heard that Commander David, uh, his last name is eluding me, but when they experienced in the jets, they experienced some sort of a craft that its propulsion oh, yeah. system as it was coming out of the water did not displace the water at all which of course defies physics yes. fascinating that is fascinating I've, I've watched the clips i've watched some interviews with them i've got no explanation for that yeah. i've never seen anything like that um in person i know those pilots are not uh, they're not you know making this stuff up they believe that stuff and they saw something and uh, the answers that are out there, I don't think are the whole story. Yeah, you can hear it in their voices, unless they're extraordinarily well-trained actors. <laughs> they they really, truly, their uh, the narrative as they're watching this transpire is... No, I'm one of the few trained actors in the, in the Navy, I think. I'm about <laughs> the only one I, that, I, that I ran into. Uh, did you have desire to further pursue acting? Not exactly. I. I guess when I graduated, I thought that maybe music was, you know, that was my other big passion. But I remember at some point thinking, you know, if I'm a pilot, I can do both. And then my friends were all getting cast in things and doing things. So I got to live vicariously through them. And I got to go to my movie premieres and, and you know, some of the fun parties and do those things. But I know, but I, I got to keep my anonymity. I got to keep my privacy. And um, so... I loved studying it, but um, it's not something I wanted to do. I thought at some point, maybe I'll do it in some music videos. I'll use some of the acting um, that I got there, um, but that was enough for me. Were you more drawn toward comedy or drama? Well, at the time, I liked drama because improv was a, was a big thing at Northwestern. And, and my band sometimes played for the improv teams. One included, I think, uh, Stephen Colbert was there at the time, David Schwimmer, but I thought that, that the improv was the most frightening thing ever because I, I didn't feel like, I'm like, you have to be so smart. Your brain has to be so quick and you have to be so fearless. And if you overthink for a second, it's over. But that's, and, you're describing landing on a, on a carrier. <laughs> well, I don't know. To me, improv was scarier. 
So, so I think I liked, I liked the idea of drama more. You know, I, I love the Coen brothers. I remember seeing Blood Simple in the theater when that came out at some midnight show and just being like, oh my gosh, this is, this is how you make films. This is amazing. You know, I loved Coppola, I, Francis Ford Coppola. I, I loved a lot of the real filmmaker at the time. So I think I liked the drama more, but part of that was because the improv thing. And we're in Chicago with Second City, and I have friends who were in Second City. And I'm like, you do you, because I, I can't even imagine how to do that. Do you know my friend David Rosowski? I do not. I think he was there around that same time because I know oh. that he, was, he was performing with Colbert and Carell and, and those guys. Uh -huh. I love it, Rob. I think it's so much fun. Oh, I love it. Don't get me wrong. I went to, I remember I would go to the Second City shows all the time. Yeah. And I remember it's like being on a tightrope performing that stuff. I can't even imagine. But yes, um, I loved it as long as I was. You know, in the audience, the <laughs> we get that. Well, let's talk about your music. Land Where the Wishes Come True is your yep. recent record. Correct. Let's talk about the genesis of that. I guess the, the initial impetus was when my, my father called me and said he, had in, he was in end-stage COPD. He had been a lifetime smoker. And he said, I don't have a lot of time, son, but you know, I'm going to make the most of what I have. You know, I start reflecting on our lives and our time together when I was little, and I almost wanted I, I wanted to, to um, write a song or a tribute to him, but I wanted to do it when he could hear it. I'm like, I don't want this to be uh, something that's after the fact. I want my dad to hear this. So it started out kind of a love letter to him. Hmm. And as I started thinking back on my childhood, you know, his job was to bring feed to the rural farmers. And I would go to these farms. Some were Amish, some were Mennonites, some were just, you know, farmers. And they didn't have very much, but they were, they were working for the American dream to put food on the table to give their kids a better life. And, and I, so I started looking back on that and thinking about, you know, in the car, singing along with Johnny Cash with my dad, you know, going to these, you know, going on these gravel roads to these little farms. And, and that just made me very nostalgic. And I said, well, how can I put that in a song? You know, how can I put all these things in there? I, I want to do a love letter to my dad. I want to do a celebration of the American dream. And, and an American dream that wasn't about going to Hollywood and being famous. It wasn't about, you know, making millions of dollars. The American dream can, can change for different people. But they were, they were very simple dreams and uh, but they were no less important so i wanted to kind of do all that and then i started thinking about you know woody guthrie's song this land is your land this land is my land and how that kind of had a universal appeal and a very very folksy very simple uh in a simple way but it really connected with people and i thought god if i could do something like that that would be Great. So, so it's probably the most complex song I've written in that if there's so much in there, a detail in that song, so much detail, if you get into it, because it covers the broken family, there's a, there's a section about my parents getting divorced. I mean, literally my brother and I climb in the car, I'm like eight or nine and, and we're going off to Christmas with mom and to see her sister and dad doesn't get in the car. That's how we found out that our parents are getting separated. So there's a little bit of that in there. So the land where the wishes come true changes throughout the song. In the beginning, it's that a farmer, it's my dad and I go to the land where the wish, wishes come true, or which is rural America where these farmers are, are trying to live the American dream. And then at the, you know, when my parents get separated and I realize they may not be together, I'm, I'm wishing they can be together. And in this utopia in my mind, they get back together. And that's the land where my wishes would have come true. And then, you know, later on in the song, it talks about me going to California and California, I find out to my dad was his land of dreams, his, the land where dreams come true. And he had started going out there as a little kid. I think he was out here the year that Disney opened. He was one of the first two weeks. He was at Disneyland with a, with a relative who lived in Long Beach. So he had all these amazing, you know, uh, this amazing love for California as a young kid, because to someone who was in the Midwest, he grew up in the Cincinnati area. That was like, you know, the palm trees, the oranges, you know, all that was like amazing to him. 
so then the land where the wishes came come true became California. And then at the end of the song is when I talk about him telling me about this, you know, this illness. And he says, you know, that maybe we'll meet again. What's his name? Tony Collins. Here's to Tony. No, it's yeah. okay. Tony Collins. I'm so sorry for your loss. No, it's he's memory. alive. He's alive. He's alive. And, and the thrill was I could play this song for him. He's still with us? Yeah. Yes. Oh, that's great. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so that was the other beauty of the song. Um, because I was able to play it for him when he's alive. And so I asked him, you know, what'd you think of the song? And he said, you've touched my heart. So, sorry about that. I didn't know I was <laughs> going to go off on Never that. apologize for having that side emotional. Road. <laughs> but um, anyway, it, you know, it's a beautiful song. And um, I love the message. And I think it's universal in a sense that, you know, we've all lost loves. We've, we've seen our lives change. We've seen our wishes change, our dreams change. But there's so much, there's so much we have in common there. And, and you know, kind of like you have Hey Human, you know, my songs is a, a secret message in all of them is Hey Human. I'm reaching out. I'm making a connection. I'm trying to bring us back to our combined humanity our own humanity because sometimes we gloss it over we get so caught up in the day and the, our electronics or whatever and we really lose touch with our own humanity and so a very long and winding story that is what i'm trying to put in this song and then the whole album became um a part of that and all supporting supporting cast members i guess for this for this concept beautiful so, and and he is alive, and we talk almost every day we can, and it's such a blessing. Love it. Um, he's got a birthday coming up, and and he'll be um, seventy nine. He said, "Son, I didn't think I'd make it till sixty four." Love you know? it. And uh, he said, "Every day is a blessing." When's his because, birthday? Uh, it's it's Greek Easter, April sixteenth. Um, he said the other thing that was interesting after I did this album, he said that he said, son, you're living my dream life. I didn't know that, you know, that kind of ties in the land where the wishes come true. He dreamt that or he, uh, he had always dreamed about doing that. And then he said, um, if I could, I said, dad, what did you want to do in life when you were younger? He said, I wanted to do music, but I'm tone deaf. Uh -huh. And then he had an accident and he hurt his fingers. Um, so he could never play piano or guitar or anything. So he said, so, you know, you're, uh -huh. you're, living that dream life too. So that was a really kind of a neat moment late in life. I had, I didn't even know those things about my own dad. I mean, that was his passion was listening to music and I'm so grateful he shared it with me. And um, I'm sure he's so proud of you. I, I think he is. Yeah, he is. I mean, we don't get to see each other as much as we'd like, but, and COVID sucked because he has COPD. So I couldn't go down there at all because you know, if, if someone in his condition had it, he's like, he can't even get a cold and, and make it through easily. So, um, but yeah, I think he is. And um, God, he has the best attitude, you know, yeah. to be given a, a death sentence, basically, and just treat every day like it's a miracle. I mean, I used to say he's the happiest retired person I've ever met. And, you know, he is just, you know, I, I told my wife, I said, you know, he taught me how to live and now he's teaching me how to die. It's Wow. Pretty cool. Um, a couple of years ago, I was uh, in Nashville and I was with a friend from acting class. She was driving me around Nashville and we went down music uh, row, meaning where they where the songwriters were in that part of town. And she said, it's so sad. These are being sold, their condos, their homes. There's no songwriters. They all, there's no songwriters. Yeah, I mean, there's still tons of songwriters. They're just not on Music Row like they used not to. Not on Music Row. Kind of, kind of like the old, I'm talking the old. Old, old way, yeah. The 90s right. way where you could walk down the street and throw a rock and hit a songwriter. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so I've got a good friend, Craig Habakurst, who is in Nashville. And um, the documentary a few years ago had come out, Country Music, you know, the um, uh, Ken Burns documentary. 
And we were talking about that. And he said, you know, what's sad is there's 25 bands, amazing bands that are coming, going to come here and they're going to go down that street looking for the songwriters and, you know, they're not going to find them. And so that got us on the tangent, like, well, why can't, why can't we do it? Why can't I do an album like the old, why can't I write songs and, and, you know, without any corporate influence and just have these amazing songs, tell these stories and put together an album with incredible musicians and just do it. I, I don't know, uh, you know, no focus groups, no, you know, teams or anything. And so we kind of, in a sense, uh, brainstormed this concept of the album together and he helped me find he interviews everyone he's a uh he literally wrote the book on the radio station that started the grand Ole opry and country music and where um you know where the music city came from the, the radio station from 1925 uh, and he literally wrote the book on that and he he is a champion of bluegrass champion of roots music champion of all you know authentic americana it was just that kind of brainstorm with him that that this took a little more shape. So that was kind of the genesis for the album. And um, you know, interestingly, there's the, the uh, I wrote a song after the title track. I wrote a song for my mom because she said um, at some point, "I'm I'm sorry I didn't give you more as a kid." And I said in, in response, I said. Mom, I'm grateful for the things I never had. And so that became the second song, which is like a love letter to my mom and all the amazing women in my life. So, you know, a lot of these songs came from like real events that just really punched me, like kind of hit me. And I'm like, well, I'm not trying to write hit songs. I'm trying to write songs that hit because all those stories really, I mean, all those in the moments hit me. And I said, well, you know, I'm going to try to capture some of that. So anyway, that was kind of, it was a trip to Nashville and kind of talking with my friend who had his finger on the pulse of everything, everything blues and Americana. And I came from like an indie world and more rock, but, but even my first album, I, I always tried to put mandolin and, and violin and stuff. And I tried to have that kind of more organic thing from the beginning, but I never really fleshed it out until now. Tell people how they can find your record. So you can look on, um, so right now I just had the one single, Land Where the Wishes Come True is out. Um, that is on, you know, Spotify, Apple, all, all of those things. And um, you can look up dnmcollins.com to read more about me and my stories. And, and uh, you know, it's on, the videos are on YouTube. So I have one video on YouTube. I've got um, my second single comes out in like 10 days. I have a, uh, a a record label in Germany called Dr. Music, and they've been helping me get the word out. And it's funny, I had to go to, to Germany to find someone to, su you know, to support me. But they but there's a big market in Germany for country music and they want authentic stuff. So I'm thrilled to be working, you know, with someone who's trying to help me out because, you know, I've got this the flying job. You know, I joke my my side gig uh, is flying, but it's not. It's my 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 main gig. And so it's been nice to have someone help me navigate all these, you know, it, it's tough. You know, 34 million songs were released in 2020 mm -hmm. with that ISRC code or whatever. That's mm -hmm. like, so half the music in, that's digital is out there has been released post pandemic. And so that is daunting for a songwriter. How do you, how is my one song in 34 million gonna you know rise get to people but then you don't really think about that and say i'm just gonna write the the best music i can that's all you can do and we have to believe that the things that we create will find their audience and touch the people that it's meant to touch yes that we don't really have control of it once once it goes out into the ether it doesn't truly belong to us if it ever did anymore yeah, yeah so my goal is to share these stories my job as a pilot is to connect people to jobs or new beginnings or relationships or family. And I think my job as a songwriter, like I said, is to connect people to their own humanity and their, their shared humanity. And so instead of being, you know, preachy or whatever, I try to take these stories and wrap them in this beautiful music played by 
you know, these incredible musicians. And I mean, I pinch myself when I think who played on this, this Kenny album. Kenny Arnoff, he's one of the greatest drummers. Yeah, the greatest drummers out there. Um, James Lomenzo, who plays with Megadeth. He, he and Kenny did the, 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 you know, rhythm tracks for me. And then Michael Cleveland, he's like one of the best fiddle players. Oh my, he's, he's incredible. And Justin Moses, uh, I mean, um, Ty Bailey, Doug Pettibone, Jimmy Zavala, who was on stage at Live Aid with Tom Petty and his band playing, you know, he plays on there. So, I mean, all these incredible musicians, you know, said yes. And they're out there making their living, you know, they're, right. they're out there playing and everything. And I, I, I wish everyone would listen to Michael Cleveland's new album, which is going to win the Grammy. I'll just, I call the last two. So I think I'm, I think I'm going to be on a roll. His is so good. What's it but, called? Uh, th what's that? What's it called? Love Loving of the Game by Michael Cleveland, but it's all stories. He's got Billy Strings. He's got Bela Fleck. He's got, you know, the McCory brothers. I mean, it is loaded and fantastic. So anyway, but, and, and you know, Kenny's out with Satriani right now. These guys are out there humping it. Yeah. And, um, but that really, the, I mean, like landing on the aircraft carrier the first time working with these guys, incredible. Sitting in my little studio in the garage when Michael Cleveland sent me his first solo, and I'm I'm just there listening to him by himself. I'm like, are you kidding? This is this is the coolest thing ever. Oh, it's magical. It was magical. So that, like I said, you know, I have to pinch myself, and that that is uh, an incredible feeling. And and I hope that when people hear these, they hear these incredible musicians. And then maybe the songs will, you know, hit them, it'll tap them right here, uh, hit them in the heart. And, um, and if not, they can tap their feet and that'll be just fine. Tap their toes. But if I can tap their heart, even better. You got to get the song on the Delta radio that plays when you, when the passengers, you know, plug into the arm. Oh, yeah. You know, I, in 2016, they put a previous album on all the Delta flights. So that was probably the most surreal moment when I, I was a captain and I was on a flight and I walked back and I see my album on the little hand TV or on the little TV monitor right next to Cheap Trek. And I'm like, whoa, how cool is this? And so, you know, even so everyone who flew on Delta that year potentially could listen, you know, to my album. And that was really one of the most incredible combining of the two passions in a, in a tangible way. Super cool. Where do you see yourself in 10 years, Dean? <laughs> well, the answer is not Delta Airlines because I have mandatory retirement in seven and a half years. So I, I don't know. I, I hope I'm still flying, but I'll be happy to fly in the back of the airplane at this point with my amazing wife. And, and we've got a lot of traveling to do together. So. I just, I see myself really happy. And, and that to me would be the biggest success story ever. That's great. All right. As a pilot or I suppose in the military as well, or as a civilian, where is the most beautiful, most favorite place that you've been in your travels on this planet? Well, I lived in Italy and I, I love Italy. But I also love Greece. My wife is Greek American. There's something about the Mediterranean and uh, the Aegean, and I think those are some of my very favorite places. Um, same, same. Yeah, and Santorini and, is like what? Oh yeah. Well, I proposed to Teresa at um, at Delphi, Greece, because that's where the oracle was. Yeah. That's what important questions got asked. Mm -hmm. And we were going to Santorini soon after, and there was a super moon. So all the betting odds, all the Vegas odds were on Santorini, but it was Delphi with uh, right in front of the um, Temple of Apollo, where the Oracle, you know, answered those questions that I proposed. And that is a very special place. Those, those uh, Italy and Greece are my, my favorites. And um, look at you, all uh, romantical and stuff. <laughs> I know it's so the heart of a poet. Yeah, yeah, the tough military guy. <laughs> Dean, Dean M. Collins for your dot com for your yeah. website, and then yeah. you have an Instagram. 
I have Instagram. I, I have TikTok, which is, um, you know, I'm like a dog and a typewriter with that. But um, I do have that. And then I have Facebook. There's a Dean M. Collins music. If you look at that on Facebook and uh, or Dean M. Collins music on Instagram, I think. But, but all that's out there in a YouTube channel as well. And I'll be putting more videos out for that. You know, it's kind of fun. My next music video stars my grand, my goddaughter. And um, I'm excited about that. She is uh, currently working with Disney. She's in the Disney family. But it's kind of fun to, you know to work with her in a music video since I've known her since she was a little, little baby. So really excited about that one. That's uh, in 10 days, we're going to share that. Um, but yeah, those are the places. And I would be thrilled if you listen to these stories and hopefully they'll resonate. Absolutely. And I'll put as always the links page, we'll have all your links so that people can find you easily and dig in a little bit to who you are. Uh, well, thank you, Susan. Dean, thank you for being on the show. Well, thank you for giving me the opportunity. This was a lot of fun, and um, and it's it's an amazing opportunity to connect with more people. And thank you for what you do for uh, for for reaching out to humanity and connecting us all. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for listening, everybody. Bye. Keep sharing your gift. Bye. Bye. Rate, review, and subscribe to Hey Human on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks. Bye.